Texas Prison Story Family. Stories written by a current prisoner. Salute y'all. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe. I want to say first thank you to you, Tony. I love your channel, man. You're the only guy out here that's doing what I'm trying to do. You put no ego into it. You put no pride into it. You don't even care about showing your face, brother. You're out here telling these kids what's real. And you're giving them stories that's true. And I thank you from Texas, brother. A lot of people on these prison channels, they like to tell the winning stories. How everything went right. How they had the keys. How they were in charge. But they don't like to talk about when things went wrong. When they were scared. When they didn't know what to do. When their locker was empty. And it happens to everybody, man. There's nobody in there staying up constantly. As soon as your money hits your books, your unit might lock down. And you have nothing. You might be on a six-month lockdown. Come up not even having time to make commissary. Bam, go back on another one. That's the real life of prison. It doesn't have to be California. It doesn't have to be Texas. All 50 states remove you from society. All 50 states take you from your children and your mother. You can't take care of either one of them from the inside. A lot of the chaos on the inside is orchestrated, whether it be by the administration or by the inmates. They know what's going to happen. It's planned, and it's designed to make men break, fold, and feed the others. It's a game that you just don't want to play. And I don't care if you're the hardest man you have the best paperwork and you're the realest cat in your neighborhood you can go down that road and everything go wrong and your life can be over or you can be spending life in a box and none of us want that what happened to me basically was a story of loyalty of me being real me spotting somebody I know needing help and me trying to come to the rescue and me getting ground up and defeated that man later caught PC took off and he was fine while I was in the hospital repairing and that's how your friends that you're loyal to will do you everything you have to think about every day on the inside is who's loyal to you who's around you and what will they do when things go wrong and you never know the answer until it happens I was literally almost two years into my sentence. I've been doing my time with respect, having fun actually, hustling, running my own store, having no worries. I was just sitting in the chow hall with one of my homies eating, chopping it up, reminiscing, and a Hispanic guy walked up to us, which ain't, is not normal. And he said, yo, Tim, there's a man that just showed up from Galveston down here. He's Hispanic with gold teeth and a bunch of tattoos and I think you know them you need to come see what's up they're having a problem so me being the man that I am and I do consider myself loyal I am from Galveston and you just presented me this problem so I need to go take care of it at least find out what's going on because that's what happens situations fall in your lap down here we take care of that situation we don't pass it to the next person because the next man will ask you why didn't you take care of it so with that being said I contacted my friend Studi Wood Studi Wood was one of the main men from Houston did a lot of time he was on a big number he was getting ready to go home he had ultimate respect so the way the politics work is the guy that was calling shots for the Hispanics wouldn't even speak to me. I literally had to get Studi Wood to go talk to him and ask him would he talk to me. So in the middle of the wreck yard, we're out here now. Everybody watching. The main man, Hispanic, Studi Wood and me. He clearly tells me, what do you want? And I told him, hey, I heard there's a Hispanic that just got here from Galveston that's having some type of situation and I need to know what's going on. The guy looked at me, and he said, what do you mean you need to know what's going on? 
and I repeated what I just said. I heard there's a Hispanic guy from Galveston having a situation. I need to know what's going on. The man looked at me coldly and said, I have control over any Hispanic that touches this unit here. Why are you worried about him? And I told him, because he's not Hispanic, he's a five deuce hoover crip. And he's one of my people. And I have control over him if he's from Galveston. He looked at me and he said, he's five deuce hoover. And I said, he is. He said, well, he didn't tell us that. I said, did you give him a chance? And he didn't answer. I said, leave my man alone. I'm going to take care of that. And you're not going to touch him. See, when we discuss a lot of prison politics and why I don't like them, because things like that happen, and that's what I used against him. Sure, he had say over all Hispanic men on that prison that touched down. He got to decide whether they stayed or left. But if a Hispanic man touches down and he's a five-deuce hoover, rolling 60 or anything else, he's no longer considered Hispanic. He's now black. And that's what got the man. He didn't know what to say, didn't know what to do. He had no idea who he was. And he agreed right then just to let him go. I will not touch this man. You tell him don't talk to none of my people and he needs to move into a cell with a black person today. And I said agreed. After that yard recall, I went inside. I planned on the next move to go down to that wing and talk to the man myself for, for the first time and see what's going on. When I went down there to see him, he was shook. He was terrified. He knew that the Hispanics were gonna make a move on him. But I told him, don't worry about it, it's over. I told him that it was fucked up. He did not come through saying he was five deuce over instantly. But I understand that this is the first time in the feds and he didn't know how things work. But that better never happen again. And this he is to move in with the black person today. And that's what happened. So, you know, we're thinking everything is okay. He's going to live his life like I live mine. Nobody's not going to have any problems. And that's exactly what happened for four days. For four days, I lived my life. I continued to sell my soups, smoke my cigarettes, and think everything was okay. On the fourth day, I went to breakfast that morning, which was kind of strange. Most of my homies in the car, they did not go to breakfast. It was mostly cornflakes or Cheerios. But I was up that morning and hungry. And I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and walk out there by myself on a compound where you know you're not supposed to walk by yourself. I did it anyways. I sat down, enjoyed my meal. I believe I got some extras. Talked to a couple homies. They left out. Literally, our tables were empty. And as I'm leaving out, I walk through the metal detector. Take maybe 10 steps. And the alarm goes off and says, everybody lay down right now. And I look over there and they're having a fight by the chow hall. And I say, shit. Instead of laying down, I just take a knee. Because it's not smart to lay down, but sometimes they'll make you. So when I take the knee, I'm looking over there to see what's going on with the fight. And all of a sudden, I just feel impact coming from the back. And I'm thinking, what the hell when I feel that I start rolling I stand up quick as I stand up I get punched in the face I say oh shit this is my first time now understanding what's going on I turn around and try to get him bam I'm hit from behind again I turn around and try to see what's going on I get bam hit from behind again I'm thinking oh man so I just basically take off running no lie as I take off running, looking for some space to even see what's going on, put my back against something so I can fight these men, I slip and trip in the ditch, and my foot got trapped in a drain grate. I was helpless. As I was literally trapped in the yard with my foot stuck in a drain gate, these men just took turns stomping me with their steel-toed or polycarbonate toed boots. Only one time did I get to grab one of them and do something real good to him. With the full force of a man, I uppercutted him to his nuts, and he fell. And that was the only thing I got justice out of, the only joy I took. And literally, while the man were beating me, I was screaming and yelling, this is what y'all do to Crips over here, motherfucker. 
it's going to be a goddamn problem. And I just knew it was going to be some revenge for this while it was happening. So there was no fear. There was no pain. There was this weird sense of you motherfuckers are going to get it. And that was all I was feeling at that time. When the cops finally come, they bring the shotgun, all that other shit, and they make them lay down. And I didn't do it. I said, I'm not laying down, man. Fuck that. They came and got me. One of the officers, he was pretty cool from Beaumont, ran right up to me and said, Snow, I think they stabbed you in the neck, man. Come on. And I said, what? He said, you're bleeding too much. Come on. And I had to get on the goddamn golf cart, which I didn't want to do, man. You always want to try to walk off if you can. When I had to get on that seat and ride. And I was scared to death when he told me I'd been stabbed in my neck, man. I thought I was going to lose my life. At that moment, when I was leaving on the golf cart, one white man named Josh from Oklahoma City that was on my wing, he stood up without permission and gave me the biggest soldier salute ever as I left the yard. And as I think back, that was the most important, meaningful, biggest sign of respect ever. And I'm pretty sure he got in trouble for that later, but he did it anyway and he knew it. So as they take me to the back, they take me to medical. Clear as day, the lady's asking me over and over again, what happened, what happened, what happened? I'm not answering. Finally, I look at her and say, what the fuck do you think happened? Leave me alone. And she said, oh, you wanna be rude, huh? They wouldn't give me any pain medicine. So I'm sitting in medical with a broken shoulder, throbbing, can't move, and they just throw me in a holding cell, tell me to calm down. When they throw me in the holding cell, I'm there for about an hour, actually calming down, still hurting, and the big homie from Fifth Ward comes and knocks on the window. He straight up asks Tim, do you owe anybody anything? Have you told on anybody? Did you do anything? What happened? And I told him, brother, none of that stuff. Go find Studi Wood. He was on the yard with me four days ago. He's going to understand everything. And he hit me with the thumbs up and said, we got you, brother. And that was the last time I seen any men from that prison on that prison. They literally transferred me to the hospital, brought me back and made me stay 72 days in the hole. So I healed up wrong and shipped me to a new place. I never even got a chance of revenge or retaliation, none of that not saying that's what I wanted but if I would have had that chance who knows but the system knows better so they move you you literally get defeated get stomped and leave in disgrace when you are in the right and that's what can happen to you